Um, so I'm going to talk about attachment, um, because that's what Neil, Neil's asked me to talk about, and that's been my main kind of intellectual uh, interest and home, if you like, over the last 30, 30 to 40 years. And uh, I'm going to try and talk about why I think attachment is important for clinicians. I gather that um, we, as a group, are quite a mixture of uh, professional uh, clinicians of one sort or another, uh, psychologists, psych psychology students, and even people who just are interested in the world of psychology and even their own inner world. So I hope to illuminate all three of those areas. Now I'm going to start with the dodo bird verdict, um, because that's also one of my uh, kind of founding uh, principles of my work as a psychotherapist. Is everyone in the room familiar with the dodo bird verdict? Right, okay, well you need to know two things. Of course, you need to know your Alice in Wonderland, and you also need your Lester, to know your Lester Loborsky paper of 1972 or 74, I think it was. Well, Lester Loborsky was a leading psychotherapy researcher, and he wrote a very influential paper, which is still 50 years on, um, seen as a, as a landmark paper, in which he uh, described what he calls the, the dodo bird verdict in psychotherapy. Now, if you remember, those of you who do remember that Alice in Wonderland will remember that Alice, she goes, she falls asleep, so the whole book, of course, is a dream. It's also a kind of satire on Victorian values. She goes, falls, falls, falls down the rabbit hole, and at the bottom, she arrives at what appears to be some kind of weird race going on. And people are running and running in all directions, round and round and round, and suddenly, the extinct dodo bird blows a whistle. And Alice, being a good Victorian little girl, thinks there's got to be winners and losers, zero-sum uh, person, like some politicians are today. And she says, well, who's won? To which the dodo bird replies, everyone has won, and all shall have prizes. And Lester Daborski took this up um, in that he was looking at, can we really show that any one form of psychotherapy is more effective than any other? And, of course, you have what's known as the allegiance effect. So if you're a CBT therapist, all your research shows that CBT is the superior treatment. If you're a psychoanalytic psychotherapist, you show that all your uh, treatment um, uh, for psychoanalytic psychotherapy is superior. If you're a systemic therapy, etc. I don't need to elaborate on that. But actually the evidence is very flimsy. The fact is that psychotherapy is an effective treatment. It's about the same as antidepressants. If you say you're suffering from depression, if you go to see uh, mild to moderate depression, let's say, if you go to see uh, a, your GP and the GP might refer you to a psychiatrist who might pre re uh, prescribe antidepressants or might refer you to a psychotherapist who might offer you a course of psychotherapy. About 60 to 70 percent of you um, in that group are going to get better. Um, about uh, 10, 15 percent are going to stay more or less the same, and about 10 percent are going to get worse. So we just need to remind ourselves that psychotherapy, although it is effective, um, is not universally effective, but nor are other treatments. The difference between psychotherapy outcomes and physical treatments such as antidepressants is that people, once their psychotherapy stops, continue to get better they improve. If you follow them up a year later, they're better. Whereas those taking antidepressants tend to either say the same or get worse once they stop their antidepressants. So there is an argument rather against the dodo bird verdict. Now, the reason I mention that is because we're going to be talking today about what I call my colleague um, Arietta Slade. By the way, I'm just going to plug my book a bit harder than... I, I couldn't really fault Neil in any way at all, but he didn't quite plug my le latest book as much as I'd like him to have done. So... <laughs> Let me tell you, Neil started off, he told me, as a businessman, and I think he's a very good businessman, as well as a very good psychologist, a rather rare combination, actually. Um, but uh, there are four, four copies of my book, so there's a kind of scarcity value. Um, so if anyone wants a copy, and it's a book I wrote with Arietta Slade, um, and if you want it signed, bring it to me um, in, the, uh, in the break. How, no, how did I get onto that? Um, yes. Uh, I'm going to be talking about attachment-informed psychotherapy, which uh, is a phrase that Arietta Slade and I uh, 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 devised. And the idea is that uh, attachment-informed psychotherapy is a meta-form of therapy. In other words, as we know, there are something like 500 different varieties of psychotherapy. And attachment-informed psychotherapy, in my view and in our view, is actually the 
sort of underlying mechanism which is produced the effectiveness of all the different psychotherapies. And that's what I'm going to be trying to explore today. Now we do have what I call the Esperanto problem. Um, if you remember Esperanto, Esperanto was developed in the 1920s, I think it was, and the idea was we're all in Europe, and this is kind of a long way apart, I'm not going to mention the B word. Uh, well, I am. I'm going to mention it once, and I'll mention it because I discovered the other day that I've got, to my horror, something in common with Michael Gove. <laughs> I've got one thing in common with I don't believe in experts, but I do believe in expertise, which is a very different thing. And I think what attachment-informed psychotherapy is about is what is the expertise of psychotherapists. But of course, psychotherapy does suffer from the expert syndrome, the, the laying on of hands, the um, apostolic succession, as uh, Michael Barlink called it, the idea that there are gurus up there who have the answers, and if we go to them, they will solve all our problems, and if we're training as psychotherapists, if they train us, we will then become magic therapists ourselves. So in that sense, I do not believe in um, experts, and nor did John Bowlby, as I'll explain in a while. Anyway, going back to the Esperanto problem, the Esperanto problem essentially is that um, the idea was, well, let's develop a common language, a meta-language, if you like, for Europe. Well, of course, the point is, it's never really caught on. We haven't got a meta-language. We all learn our mother tongue, and it's a little bit like that for psychotherapists. If you want to train as a psychotherapist, you've got to choose a modality, whether it's psychoanalytic or CBT or systemic, etc., or group analytic. But at the same time, in a way, you need to recognise that the grammar that you use is a common grammar that will be uh, uh, um, you'll find in all that. So I'm saying that attachment is a meta-perspective for all psychotherapists, a deep grammar for psychotherapists. And I would say it's a bridge from everyday caring to mutative therapeutic listening. I'm going to say something a little bit about expertise. Um, I'll say it now because I'm going to repeat it again. So what is the expertise of the psychotherapist as opposed to the expertness? I believe, and I'll elaborate on this, it's a specific and particular form of listening. I will elaborate on that later, probably after the break. So if you adopt this meta-perspective, if you're a, a common factors psychotherapist as I am, if you believe in the dodo bird verdict, you've got to find, well, what are the common factors that all psychotherapists share? And one way of thinking about this is to say, well, they fall under three main headings. The therapeutic relationship, some kind of explanatory framework for understanding the problems that our clients bring to us, and some mechanism for promoting change. And I'm going to say um, something about each of those in relation to attachment theory. So let's go straight into attachment. Attachment has two, gra uh, two grandparents. Grandparent number one is Sigmund Freud. John Bowlby, trained as a psychoanalyst in the 1930s, or 20s and 30s, and um, he was quite dissatisfied with the with two aspects of psycho uh, psychoanalysis as he encountered it. One is that it wasn't really a scientific theory, um, that it relied on, uh, uh, relied on authority rather than on evidence. And in particular, he felt that there was a downplaying of the role of the environment and an overemphasis, as it were, on internal and inner fantasy as the basis for neurosis. So, although he was trained as a psychoanalyst, although he remained in a way loyal to psychoanalysis, he was also very interested in how do we actually study human development. And he realised that ethology, there was a new science that had been developed um, by Conrad Lorenz and Nico Ten Tinberg in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. And this essentially was a way of looking at uh, the natural world, uh, the living world, looking at animals, in their natural environment. So it wasn't the kind of psychology that was about studying rats in mazes. It was going out, I mean, Robert Hind, who was a great friend of Bowlby and contributed to attachment theory, uh, um, once told me his PhD consisted in 1950 or somewhere around then, someone handed him a tape recorder, pointed at him at a wood and said, go and understand birdsong. And that was, in a way, the basis of ethology. In other words, ethology is studying animals in their natural habitat. So Bowlby said, well, why don't we study children in their natural habitat? Why do we base all our theories on what happens in the consulting room? So he brought a scientific uh, angle, as it were, into the world of psychoanalysis. 
And the point about this picture, and I love the picture anyway, um, is that it contains the essence of attachment. Because what Conrad Lorenz discovered was that when these geese are born, they will follow and take as their attachment figure um, any object or creature that moves. So he separated little goslings on their first day of birth from their mother and pretended himself to be a mother goose, whereupon they became imprinted on him, to use his word, and therefore the attachment relationship was established. And he did this in all sorts of ways. He even did it with a cardboard box, I believe, on the end of a piece of string. He'd pull it along, and the goslings would take the cardboard box as their mother. So Bowlby immediately thought, is something similar going on in the world of humans? So there is John Bowlby. That's his, those are his dates. Now, I was and a bit sad in a way. He, uh, again, I've got his second disappointment with Neil, but everything else about Neil is wonderful, in that he talked about John Bowlby, as it were, as the founding father of uh, attachment theory. Actually, there are two founders to attachment theory, John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth. And Mary Ainsworth is of equal importance, and it's a very interesting marriage, actually, because Bowlby was a Brit, um, he was a psychiatrist, he was a kind of theoretician, he wasn't really an experimentalist. Mary Ainsworth was originally Canadian but lived in, Ca in America for most of her life. She was a, a psychologist and she was an absolutely passionate experimentalist. And it was a kind of marriage made in heaven because together they created the edifice that is attachment theory. And all the research that's flowed from attachment theory was done either by Mary Ainsworth herself or by her PhD students or her PhD students, PhD students. So all the big names really in psycho, uh, in attachment theory um, are mostly North American and they are Mary Ainsworth uh, responsible. So we do need to think that actually attachment theory is a, a, a byproduct, a, a, I don't mean a byproduct, um, a bilateral product of John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth, a man and a woman. So I'm now going to say a little bit about attachment theory. and we'll, uh, uh, Let's just go back to my three um, features of the meta perspective on psychotherapy or the three common factors in psychotherapy, the attachment relationship, the theoretical framework, and producing change, um, promoting change. So I'm going to say, how does attachment theory theorize relationships? And I'll say a bit about that. These are just some headings, so I won't go through them. One way of uh, just reminding oneself about the attachment like dynamic, I live in, the, in a rural area, is to go into a field with sheep and their lambs in the spring. And the moment you go into that field, all the lambs will rush back. They've been playing quite happily away from their mothers. They will rush back to their mothers. And that illustrates beautifully the attachment dynamic. Under conditions of threat, then... The attachment dynamic is triggered in parents and children and it brings those parents and children into close proximity and therefore protects the uh, vulnerable infant from any potential threat. Now this is, was a hugely important um, idea for Bowlby and his uh, collaborators when they were theorising attachment. They had the idea that if we think about what they call the uh, environment of evolutionary adaptation, if we think about early man in the Old Vai Gorge, which in what is now Kenya or uh, Ethiopia, we're an incredibly vulnerable species. We're not particularly strong. We can't run particularly fast. We haven't got very big claws or teeth. We've only got two things. We've got brains and we've got each other. Now, the reason or the fact that we've got brains means that we have to be born in a very, very immature state to get that big brain through the birth canal. And it also means that we're going to have a long period of huge uh, dependency and vulnerability. Those little lambs are up and running within half an hour of birth. Well, it takes us a year even to get upright. Therefore, so that's number one, the big brain, we can think. And number two, we've got each other but we need an evolutionary devised mechanism for us, as it were, to protect 
our vulnerable offspring, and that is the attachment dynamic. So when those little babies on the old by gourd, surrounded by predators, they sense threat, they vocalize, and that activates the attachment dynamic in the caregiver. Now, this is a, that's the fundamental concept of attachment theory, and it applies throughout the life cycle. If you start thinking, you know, I, I may be anticipating some of my slides, we've moved on a little bit, we've expanded the idea of the attachment dynamic from simply a form of protection, because although we do live in a, in a potentially threatening environment, although, of course, that's hugely exaggerated these days, and London... Um, as Steven Pinker has shown, is a far, far safer place to live in today than it was um, 100 years ago or 150 years ago. Um, but we still see it as rather threatening. And of course, there are motor cars and there are sort of uh, violent, there is violence about. So we've, but we need to expand the concept of attachment to include affect regulation. If you think about a baby crying in the night, that baby is in distress, a six month old your baby. And there's, I'm speaking very much from experience because I've been staying with my grandchildren this weekend. Um, that baby then, at, uh, in a not particularly sound approved house, um, <laughs> and so that baby will activate the caregiver. Mum or dad will then have to drag themselves out of bed and go to that baby. Now that baby doesn't know what it is that's causing his or her distress. The caregiver then has to work this out. Is my, is my child too hot, too cold, had a bad dream, need the nappy change, need some food? Um, needs turning over, um, etc. So the, the mother's brain is yoked in, as it were, by the baby's brain, and together they work out what's wrong. That baby's affect is being regulated by the mother. And there's a kind of conversation going on between them, because if, let's say, the mum changes the baby's nappy and the baby's still crying, then the mum may think, oh, well, I haven't quite got that right. Or the baby's saying, you haven't quite got that right, what I need is a feed, something of that sort. So there's a kind of conversation going on, a mutual affect regulation. So we have to think of the function of uh, attachment as having these two, well, attachment as having these two functions. One, protection from threat. Um, actually, Bowlby extended that. So he said the attachment dynamic is uh, triggered by separation, threat, and illness or exhaustion. So the baby who is tired or slightly ill will kind of uh, stop playing and go and sit on mum or dad's lap and snuggle up, that kind of thing. So there's the attachment dynamic. But we now extend that, that attachment is necessary because it helps us to regulate our affect. And that, as I shall, ex as I shall explain in a minute, helps us to understand what our affects are. And that process may be uh, compromised in the kinds of patients who come for psychotherapy. And a huge part of the work that psychotherapists do can be seen in terms of affect regulation. Let's go back a few slides now. So there's the attachment dynamic. Um, now, the question is, uh, well, um, what counts as an attachment relationship? Is a relationship with a friend or a teacher um, um, or an acquaintance an attachment relationship? Well, my sort of rubric here is, I used to say to my patients, let's say you're run over by the proverbial London bus, you end up in hospital, who is the first person that you will ring or contact? And that will give you a key or a clue to who, who is their primary secure base or their primary attachment figure. So um, it's very rare. I mean, there, there will be situations where one would ring an acquaintance or a friend but it's much more likely that you're going to ring your father, your mother, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, um, possibly a sibling. The only, though the major exception to this, I think, is military buddies. Um, so that soldiers in war make and take their comrades as their attachment figures. And it's uh, because that's where their security and safety lies. And the question, um, and it's one I think that... It, is interesting to discuss and think about is whether or not a, a therapist becomes an attachment figure for a patient. But it's certainly true that the attachment dynamic operates in the uh, consulting room. And this is quite an issue that I think therapists don't often uh, or sometimes don't grasp. Going to see a therapist is an incredibly anxiety-provoking phenomenon. And especially in the early stages, and when you first come into the room with your therapist, you're in a state of slight panic. 
Therefore, I always say no interpretations in the first five minutes. And the same applies at the end of the session, because when you're going, you're then, in a way, returning to a state of threat. You haven't got somebody there to regulate your affect, to keep you safe. Therefore, I also kind of say no interpretations in the last five minutes, because an interpretation will fall on deaf ears if someone is in a state of the attachment dynamic. The attachment dynamic has to be seen in terms of, as it were, a kind of an alternative to exploration. On the one hand, we're exploring the world, trying to, if you're a, a little lamb, you're trying to find out where the good grass is, as it were. But if somebody comes into that field who might attack you, um, then you rush back to your secure base and you stop thinking even about that grass, as it were, that's going to be good. And the same applies to us as, applies to us as humans. Now, I want to just add one more point to this, which is, it's not all negative. These, um, oh, no, well, perhaps I'll just expand on this, because I said that the attachment dynamic applies throughout the life cycle. Now, we all think we're terribly grown up and we're sitting here and we don't need any secure bases or attachment figures. But let's suppose, actually, Niall didn't say this, but let's suppose the fire alarm goes off or there's an explosion outside in Mallet Street and we have to leave the building. And we go, of course, in a very orderly fashion. What's the first thing we'll do when we come out of, that, uh, of this building? I would guess most of us will put our hands in our pockets and ring our husband, our wife, our girlfriend, our boyfriend, our mum, our dad, our parrot, our um, begonia, or whatever our attachment figure happens to be. So the attachment by a dynamic is there in latent form. And that also, I think, applies to positive experiences. So it isn't just negative. So if you s at last discover you're pregnant, or you finally pass that exam, or you've got your um, a driving test, um, uh, uh, you passed a driving test or something like that, you will immediately want to tell someone, you'll want to share it with someone, and again, that will be the clue or the cue to the uh, secure base per figure, um, your attachment figure. So actually, now I come to think of it, in retrospect, when I was asking patients who's the first person, pers first person you'd ring when you come out of the, um, uh, when you wake up in hospital, it could have been, who's the first person you'd ring if you suddenly get the job you've been applying for, or something of that sort. So all this is about the attachment relationship in the consulting room, which is the uh, uh, sort of sine qua non, um, it's the precondition of effective therapy. You have, as it were, there has to be a kind of trusting relationship build up between therapist and patient, which can, has the contours and the aspects of the attachment relationship. Now, another thing about attachment is that it's very specific. Um, I'm sure there are people in this room who've, who've got, who have had five-year-olds starting at school, coming up to Christmas, um, and they will write, um, uh, they might do a Christmas card for their mum or dad, and it'll always say, for the best mum in the world, or the best dad in the world. Um, well, that, of course, objectively, cannot be the case, because um, there can only be one best dad in the world. Um, if you adopt a utilitarian approach. But of course it's absolutely true because of the specificity, and this is a rather cynical way of putting that by uh, George Bernard Shaw, uh, who had a rather sort of uh, dodgy marital history actually. He was turned down by one person that he proposed to, and he literally the very next day, I think, um, uh, rang somebody else and proposed to her. Uh, <laughs> So feeding, now one of the things that those of you who've done psychology degrees or even psychology A-level or even just read the papers occasionally will remember those rather pathetic pictures of little rhesus monkeys clinging to wire mums. But this was a very important uh, a, a study um, that Bowlby built a lot on. Um, and what um, the, the, it was, these were studies done in the 1960s. Um, and the, the question was, what bonds a baby monkey to its mother? Is it food or is it something else? And so um, uh, the uh, experimenter um, created a setup where there was a wire mother with a kind of bottle sticking out and a terry nappy mother with no bottle sticking out. And he, um, uh, Harry Harlow, who did these experiments, then observed what uh, direction did the little baby rhesus monkeys go to and surprise, surprise, they go to the terry mo mo uh, uh, nappy mother. They go to something soft that they can cuddle rather than rushing straight for the food. Now, Bowlby built a lot of, on this because in the world of psychoanalysis, the breast was seen as, as it were, 
um, the most important uh, communicative relationship with the baby because it provided milk. And what Bowlby was saying was, no, what is equally important is the relationship with the mother, the holding, the cuddling, the playfulness, the eye gaze, etc. Um, so what is it that bonds mothers and babies together and fathers and babies together? And what is it that uh, underpins the attachment relationship? We, well, we now know that there's an, a neuroendocrine aspect to this. Most of you have probably heard of oxytocin, um, which is, of course, released at the moment of birth. But it, there is biobehavioral syn synchrony. There's a kind of to and fro um, levels of oxytocin that go on in the early weeks and months of life, which create this attachment bond. And biobehavioral synchrony starts at birth. And then I've already described this idea of affect co-regulation. And the point and the research shows that if children who've had this uh, experience of biobehavioral synchrony, who've had this experience of accurate emotional co-regulation, they begin to be able to regulate and cope with their own feelings. And by the time they uh, preschool or get into school, this is manifest in terms of social competence. So the attachment relationship has a, a bearing on psychological health. And if we think about the clients that come to us in therapy, these um, are people who almost certainly have had some kind of compromise in this attachment um, relationship. Um, now, an important point that Bowlby picked up on was the idea that we're set from an early stage on developmental pathways. And if you have a secure attachment to developmental pathway, then um, sadly, one has to say that um, good things lead to better things and bad things lead to worse things. So that is bringing us in the direction of secure attachment versus the various patterns of insecure attachment. And these can be thought of in terms of developmental pathways. And Mary Ainsworth, it was, who devised um, a test for this, which has now been used uh, in uh, whole in, uh, hundreds and thousands, actually over, th over thousands of times, to study um, the relationship between infants and their caregivers around aged one um, in a variety of social, uh, economic, and uh, ethnically diverse situations. And the essence of the uh, setup, um, which Mary Ainsworth devised, is what's known as the strange situation. Now, what is the strange situation? A strange situation, um, a, a, a caregiver and child are invited to some kind of laboratory, to an office, where there's an experimenter who's a friendly person, and in this office there are a couple of chairs and lots of toys on the floor. And the baby um, sits on mum's lap initially because the attachment uh, dynamic is triggered by simply arriving in a strange situation. And then the baby will probably get down and start playing with the toys. The child is then subjected to stress, and the stress, which for a one-year-old is quite large, the caregiver goes out of the room for three minutes. Now, if you're in a strange room you've never been in before and your caregiver goes out of the room for three minutes, this is pretty threatening. This activates the caregiving dynamic and the child will stop playing, so they'll move away from exploration into the attachment uh, dynamic and then eventually the caregiver, mum or dad, comes back into the room and... Um, in a, a secure attachment, the child will have expressed quite a lot of distress and anger, you know, will cry, um, will wail, will say, if they could say, why the hell were you dumping me with this horrible person in the strange room? And the caregiver will pick the child up and soothe the child. And within a few minutes, that rupture will have been repaired. They'll say, it's all right, mummy's back now. I was just going to the loo, I'm fine the child will get off the lap and start playing again. That is the secure attachment dynamic, a rupture and a repair, and exploration takes over. And healthy protest. What Mary Ainsworth um, discovered was that actually there are a number of different patterns that one sees in the strange situation, which have long-term developmental consequences. So those children who show that secure attachment pattern age one are going to be far more socially competent aged five when they go to school than their counterparts who show different patterns of insecure attachment. By the way, dads can do it just as well as mums. They just do it in a slightly different way. Um, so they don't do this kind of soothing and rocking quite so well. They might use distraction. They might sort of pick the child up, 
throw them up, catch them, say, oh, look at that, there's a nice ball over there, or something of that sort. But it works. The child's distress is assuaged, and they return to exploratory play. Now, there are various patterns of insecure attachment, which Mary Ainsworth defined, but they can be seen, basically, there are three basic patterns, and two of them are kind of contradict, uh, are kind of at opposite ends of a pole. So at one end, you have the, what's known as the avoidant, or the, uh, later in life, the dismissive pattern, um, or the hypo-activating pattern. So these are children who don't show much distress, because they, as it were, have learned that it's not a good idea to show distress to your caregiver, because they may reject you. And you need that caregiver. You need to stay near that caregiver. So those children are to some extent inhibited in their exploratory play and they're inhibited in their affective expression. And at the same time, they do show very high levels of distress in terms of their um, uh, distress hormones um, and their heart rate um, and their sweating. So these are children who, as it were, have quite difficult feelings which they suppress. The other end of the spectrum are the children who cannot be soothed, who make a massive um, fuss, but they are not assuaged, and those are called the hyperactivating um, or the anxiously attached pattern. And these correlate to some extent with developmental pathways. So the, um, the caregivers who keep their children at a bit of a distance tend to have the um, uh, tend to have the dismissing pattern or the avoidant pattern or the hypoactivating pattern, and the uh, caregivers who are somewhat inconsistent. One minute they're intruding on the child's play, the next minute they don't seem to be there at all. They're the ones who tend to have children who show this hyperactivating anxious attraction pattern, because if you've got a caregiver whose attention you cannot grab, then it's quite a good idea to make a lot of fuss so that they, as it were, have no choice but to keep an eye on you and protect you. So one of the findings of attachment theory is that we can classify these developmental pathways that people find themselves on, they have long-term consequences, and they relate to patterns of handling in uh, infancy. Another important finding in this uh, uh, attachment, we're still in the attachment world, as it were, the, the uh, stage one, is that uh, researchers have found that in the first six months or so of life, caregivers and children have periods throughout the day, several periods throughout the day, where there is intense mutual gaze. And Gurgley and Watson, who studied this, said there were two features of this intense mutual gaze. One of them was what they called contingency, and the other was what they called marking. Now, contingency means that the caregiver, the mum or dad, waits for the child to make the first move. And marking means then the caregiver, as it were, mirrors or marks or <coughs> feeds back to the child whatever it is that first move was. So let's the say um, dad, um, say it's dad because uh, I'm a dad, um, and a granddad and a great-granddad almost, um, picks up the child and says, oh, we are feeling a bit miserable today, aren't we? So the child is very slightly down in the mouth, and the caregiver, using mother ease, this high-pitched um, uh, tone that parents use when they're talking to babies, because babies are much better at hearing high pitches than low pitches, exaggerates it. And that exaggeration is a message to the child, you are seeing your own affect mirrored in my face and in my voice. So the child then, as it were, can begin to understand and introject and have, as it were, a representation of their own feelings. So we go from co-regulation of affect to the beginnings of self-regulation of affect in the context of, a, uh, of uh, the parent-child relationship. Now, it seems to me that psychotherapists do something very similar, or certainly psychoanalytic psychotherapists like myself, do something very similar with our clients. The client comes in, they're probably feeling a little bit threatened or stressed, and we therapists, we just wait, and we see whatever it is that the client brings. We might have to encourage them a little bit, might just say, hmm, or, well, or what sort of week was it, or something of that sort. And then we, so we wait in this... And then our response is a response to whatever it is that the client brings. And we then kind of underline it. We mark it. We say something like, mm, wow, that was quite a week, wasn't it? Or, mm, goodness, let's hear a bit more about that. So this process of affect regulation is integral 
to the attachment relationship, that's what I'm saying. And this fits in with uh, Donald Winnicott, the psychoanalyst, who um, really had this extraordinary capacity for intuitively understanding all this stuff, although he was no scientist, um, and um, just from his intuitive knowledge of children. Um, so he realized that this process, this mirroring process, can be compromised. So if the caregiver, mum, dad, and also therapist, is stressed, depressed, intoxicated, drugged, their capacity for mirroring will be compromised. So the child then won't be seeing his or her feelings in the caregiver's face. He'll be seeing the caregiver's feelings. And this is an interesting issue because this, of course, is one of the things which brings uh, one of our jobs, as it were, as therapists, is to be able to um, repeat or to carry out this affect regulation. But in a way, one of the things which may have brought us into the world of psychotherapy is that we as children may have, as it were, become quite experts at reading our caregivers' minds. So there's a little bit of a paradox in there. I like to give this picture of Francis Bacon, famous, one of the best, famous, one of the most uh, wonderful painters of the 20th century, but a very, very disturbed man. He's an alcoholic, homosexual, um, very unhappy person, um, eventually died of drink. He was very keen on triptyches, but he was also keen on these very distorted um, facial images. And my idea is that this may be, as it were, what happens in the developmental history of someone who, whose caregiver has been depressed or stressed or intoxicated. Um, and he, of course, was able to use the canvas, as it were, the blank space of the canvas to explore these feelings. Our clients use the blank space in the canvas of therapy to explore them. Uh, Winnicott picked up on this idea that um, in these kinds of situations, the child may, as it were, adapt to whatever it is the caregiver wants them to be feeling. And that's the kind of picture that he <laughs> developed there. Uh, this is an important statement. I'm not going to read it out. Now, that slide is illustrating Bowlby's original idea that we need attachment because we live in this very threatening environment. Um, but I'm arguing, and I have argued, that actually we extend this now to affect regulation. Um, I'm just going to give an example of affect regulation, as it were, in everyday life. Um, uh, this is a videotape um, that uh, you can find on YouTube, um, and um, it's uh, a fascinating little study. Um, if, you want to, uh, uh, if you want to elicit the attachment dynamic in four-month-year-olds, you can't do the strange situation. You can't leave a four-month-year-old on their own um, for three minutes. So what do you do? Well, you uh, develop what's known as the uh, still-face paradigm. So you put mum and baby side by side, and you say to the mum at some point, and they're talking to each other or communicating with each other, and you say to the mum, OK, when I give the sign, I want you to s uh, freeze your face for one minute. And um, that acts as a kind of threat to the child. Now, what you'll see, if you look this up on YouTube, um, uh, just look, type in st uh, uh, um, still face paradigm, what you'll see is this delightful little baby who's communicating 19 to the dozen with mum regresses. He can't understand why she's not responding to him. And the less he understands, the more his posture becomes like a newborn baby, and the more his vocalizations go from these quite complex vocalizations to kind of high-pitched screaming. So we're all the time in this highly interactive, affective state with our caregivers. Um, and this is a similar uh, study in which um, babies and their mums were videotaped, um, and mothers were then classified as securely or insecurely attached. And what was found was that um, insecurely attached mums are pretty good when their babies are happy, but when their babies are unhappy, then they tend to be rather rejecting. So the study shows that insecure mothers don't really find it easy to regulate their children's negative affect. And there may be, this, may, this is a funny little slide, but it just shows that negative affect is far more important than positive affect because negative affect can lead to death, whereas positive affect may lead to just slight unhappiness. So, in other words, um, 
we're far more sensitive to poisonous substances on our tongues than we are to sweet substances, because if you don't eat for a day, you'll survive. But if you eat poison, that's the end of you. So we need to be highly sensitive and have ways of regulating negative affect. And of course, our, we psychiatrists and psychotherapists spend a lot of time regulating our, our patients and our clients' um, negative affect. And we need to be able, as it were, to cope with the fact that our patients are going to hate us from time to time. So openness to negative emotion is crucial. Security providing parents, and they're not just good at um, regulating their children's negative affect, they also are able, as it were, to celebrate their specialness. And we, um, therapists tend to be a little bit uh, coy about talking about saying nice things to their clients and probably not to tell their supervisors about them. But actually, of course, good therapists do um, uh, say nice things to their clients. The sort of thing that I would probably want to say is something like, well, getting that job sounds excellent and they must really believe in you. But I suppose we need to think about whether you're not just doing all this to please me or your mum, something of that sort. Um, I'm going to go on. Right. So uh, the next se sort of section two of my talk is what kind of explanatory framework do we offer to understand the difficulties that psychotherapy clients bring to therapists? Because every therapy has either implicitly or explicitly an explanatory framework. Well, I've touched a little bit on that already, this idea of secure and insecure developmental pathways and their long-term consequences. Uh, it's interesting to think about diagnosis, um, because in a way saying, well, we, this is uh, insecure <coughs> attachment, is a kind of diagnostic statement. And diagnosis is a kind of, uh, quite an ambivalent kind of phenomenon, isn't it? On the one hand, a diagnosis, you know, if you've got tummy ache and the doctor sort of and you think, oh my goodness, you know, I must have bowel cancer or something. And the doctor says, no, you've just got irritable bowel, don't worry about it. That's hugely reassuring. So, in other words, we go from uncertainty into some kind of sense of being able to uh, understand what's going on. On the other hand, of course, a diagnosis can be a kind of distancing phenomenon. It obviates thought, it reifies, closed down uh, freshness and creativity. So um, we have to kind of tread a path between these two uh, Scillas and Charybdises, as it were. Now I'm going to say a bit about D. I mentioned the two main forms of insecure attachment that we see in the general population. I mean, in this room, um, about 60 or 65 percent of us will probably be securely attached. Um, about 20 percent of us, including me probably, um, are somewhat avoidant. Um, and um, about 12 to 15 percent of us will be um, uh, anxiously attached. When it comes to um, and a very small percentage of us, under 5%, will uh, 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 be what um, was described by one of Mary Ainsworth's uh, PhD students, probably her most famous PhD student, that's to say Mary Main, as disorganised attachment. What is disorganised attachment? Well, there are some children who, when put in the strange situation, behave in very bizarre ways. Um, the thing about it, um, insecure attachment that I've described so far is they are quite organised. You know, you either just suppress your emotions or you hype them up a bit, but you're still related to your caregiver. This disorganised child will perhaps go to the corner of the room, rock backwards and forwards, put their head over their hands, bang their head slightly against the wall, behave in slightly bizarre ways, and when the caregiver returns, no kind of connection seems to be made. The point about disorganised attachment is that it's very rare in, um, or relatively uncommon, in non-clinical populations, but it's very, very, co or it's much more common than the other two patterns if you look at socioeconomically stressed families, single parent families, families where there's a history of um, mental illness um, and a history of drug addiction, um, where there's been abuse, physical or uh, uh, sexual, or neglect, which we have to remember neglect is probably the most uh, psychopathologically producing form of uh, 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 um, pathological childcare. So disorganised attachment, we need to know about it because our difficult clients who come into therapy are most likely as infants and small children to have experienced disorganised attachment. And disorganised attachment is really a kind of way of saying, how do I survive in this world if I haven't got a caregiver that I can turn to? And um, these are, this little picture uh, is a kind of metaphor 
And what I'm trying to show here is how difficult it is working with people who have had an experience of disorganised attachment because when they come into therapy, rather like that little kangaroo jo joey who's born in the birth canal, but then in this incredibly vulnerable state has to crawl all the way up the mum's um, tummy and into the pouch where then development can continue. Our clients with disorganised attachment in a way have to do something similar. They have to learn to trust us before they can begin, as it were, to um, enter into a world where they're not just doing their best to survive and nothing much else. And remember that we, in the end, what are we doing with our clients? Well, it's kind of non-verbal because we're creating a safe space, a warm, secure, non-interrupted, regular, predictable environment. Although actually in the current NHS, with hot desking, um, uh, this is far less uh, sure, and that's, a, in my opinion, an incredibly important um, uh, problem. Um, but we are also, in the end, we've got to use words. And so we've got to think about disorganised attachment and the impact of disorganised attachment and how our very difficult clients are going to find it massively difficult to trust us. And we're also going to have to think about what kinds of conversations we have with our patients. Now, Mary May... Um, is famous for two things in the world of attachment research. First of all, identifying disorganised attachment and also for something called the adult attachment interview. Now, the adult attachment interview was devised by Mary Main um, and it's simply really a, what I would call a psychotherapy assessment interview that's tape recorded and you talk to an individual about their developmental history, about their mum and dad um, and you ask, um, tell me a bit about your mum and dad, um, Give me some um, adjectives that will describe, give me five adjectives that will describe your mum and dad. And um, you then also ask about loss, separation, trauma, etc. Now what Mary Main was interested in was not so much what had happened to individuals, but the way in which they talk about what's happened to them. And this is a massively important message, I think, for psychotherapists. As psychotherapists, we sometimes home in much too much on what happened to our clients and not nearly enough on how whatever it is that's happened to our clients has been processed. Because after all, all sorts of horrible things, things happen to all sorts of us that don't necessarily lead to us developing psychological illness or needing psychotherapy. I mean, psychoanalytic, if you live in the psychoanalytic world, you kind of think that you cannot possibly be a healthy individual unless you've had about five years of five times a week psychoanalysis. But actually, most people out there in the normal world don't have any kind of psychotherapy, and yet they may have had all kinds of trauma. But they've, because possibly they've had secure attachment, they've been able to cope with that trauma. They've been able informally, as it were, to look after themselves. Anyway, Mary Main said, let's think about how people talk about their experiences. So if someone sort of says, uh, tell me a bit about your childhood, they just say, well, it's just a normal childhood, nothing special. Can't remember anything much before I was about nine. How is your mother? No, oh, she's just a normal mum. Well, can you give me an example of how she... Well, I'm not really. I mean, she was just a normal mum. Now, that sounds OK, but actually that illustrates dismissive attachment. That illustrates dismissiveness. This is an individual who, as it were, can't bring to mind their actual experience and who cannot bring to mind the affective aspects of their experience and who can't share that experience and, that, um, and therefore move in the direction of co-regulation with a therapist. So Mary uh, Main classified people not in terms of what had happened to them, not in terms of the amount of trauma they'd experienced, but how they processed that trauma and as revealed in their language. And she drew on a philosopher called Grice, it's not really important, but she had this idea that um, there are certain kinds of language which actually um, have this capacity to be uh, fresh, innovative, to the point, relevant. And she called those Grice's maxims, and those um, uh, led to her being able to classify these adult attachment interviews as either secure, autonomous, who had all those features, dismissing, preoccupied, or unresolved. And these, as it were, map onto the strange situation patterns that I was describing earlier of secure attachment, insecure, avoidant, insecure, anxious, and disorganised. Now let's come into the uh, consulting room. These are the kinds of things that therapists say to their clients. 
or certainly the kinds of things that I used to try and say to my clients. Hang on a minute, I can't quite visualise that. Can you, f so if you, this, uh, let's have this dismissing client who may uh, present, uh, let's say, um, or be referred to psychotherapists because they have um, somatic symptoms of no, uh, or there's no physical basis for it, or they may experience depression or something of that sort, and these are dismissive individuals who have had no ex experience of affect co-regulation. They haven't been able to uh, process their negative affect. So I, as a therapist, will be working quite hard, thinking this is a dismissive client. Um, I've got to get them somehow to be able to bring feelings to life in the consulting room. I can't quite visualise that. Can you clarify? Can we have a story? Let's have a story about your mum. You say she was a normal mum. OK, you're coming back from school. Um, you're age five or seven. Tell us what happens next. So we're all the time trying to create this granularity or the devil's in the detail aspect, which is a characteristic of secure attachment. Um, or you might say, um, hang on a minute, you're going much too fast for me. Just say that all over again. So all the time we're trying as it were, to create a vivid and fresh uh, experience in the consulting room. We're shaping the client's narratives. Now, we can think about uh, speech, therefore, in a Wittgensteinian sense. You've got Nietzsche, so I can mention Wittgenstein um, uh, after me. Um, Wittgenstein said, listen, language isn't just uh, 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 conveying information. It's also an action. The usual example that's given here is, is a meeting. By the way, one of the wonderful things about being more or less retired is that I never have to go to meetings anymore. Um, but what, uh, the example that's usually given of a speech act is at the end of a meeting, the chairperson says, OK, let's leave it till next week or something like that. Now, that isn't just conveying information. It's also an action. So people immediately then pick up their papers, start chatting in an informal way to the next door neighbour, etc. So language is a speech. Um, we have to think of language as speech acts. And it was... Wittgenstein, who had this idea. And attachment research is now looking at what kinds of conversations go on in um, psychotherapy sessions in relation to the attachment status of the client. And what is found is that these uh, securely attached um, uh, individuals in psychotherapy are able to have a kind of make something new with their, client, with their therapists, whereas the sec insecurely attached individuals tend, as it were, to try and maintain the status quo, to keep things just as they were. Well, if we think that our job as therapists is to create novelty, then that's, uh, as it were, the challenge that we have to face and one that's presented to us as attachment therapists. So um, that illustrates that point. Now let's move on to another attachment, uh, a related attachment concept that's emerged in the last 20 years or so. And this is this idea of ment mentalising. Uh, have some of you come across the term mentalising before? I'm sure you have, yes. And there is now a, uh, an actual school of psychotherapy called MBT, Mentalisation Based Therapy. Now it all goes back to a study uh, carried out by um, Miriam and Howard Steele and uh, Peter Fonagy in the 1990s, early 1990s. They took mothers pregnant for the first time and their uh, uh, husbands or partners and they uh, gave them the adult attachment interview. And they then followed these uh, uh, couples up um, when their baby was born and they then um, did the strange situation, classified their infants in the strange situation when they were about one years old. So it was a study that took about two years. And surprise, surprise, what they find was that parents who are securely attached tend to have infants who are securely attached. Parents who are insecurely attached tend to have infants who are insecurely attached. So it shows a kind of transgenerational transmission of attachment patterns. But the important point from our discussion now about this study was they then took a subgroup of uh, parents who had had very traumatic upbringing. So they'd had loss of parent, divorce, separation, etc. in uh, childhood. And they then developed on the adult attachment interview a subscale which they called reflexive function. Now reflexive function is the capacity as it were to think about your own thinking and to reflect on your experience. So in the uh, adult attachment interview you sort of say uh, tell us a bit about your mum and they say well my mum um, you know we had a quite a difficult childhood our dad left when we were nine um, mum had to go out to work she was really stressed at times. 
it must have been really difficult for her coping with us kids and uh, not really having enough mom, money and dad you know, showing up every now and then. That's reflexive function. That person would score highly on reflexive function because that is someone who is able to put him or herself into the shoes of another individual. Now what this, I think, hugely important study showed was that if you take parents who've had trauma in their childhood, who have high scores on reflexive function, their infants are going to be securely attached. Whereas those that score low on reflexive function tend to transmit the insecurity to their children. So therefore, the capacity to what's now called mentalise, because reflexive function has kind of morphed into the term mentalisation. Mentalisation is, as it were, a resilience factor. It's something that enables you to navigate and to survive trauma and difficulty in your life. So we can then begin to think that, well, a whole lot of research has flown from this, but we can now begin to think that the capacity to mentalise is something that we're trying to instil in our clients. Um, my friend Anthony Bateman, um, who's one of the co-founders of MBT, Mentalization Based Therapy, says we use this capacity, we use this phenomenon in therapy because in therapy all kinds of things happen that aren't ideal. A um, client might come in and say, hey, you stopped the session five minutes early last week and you never said a word about it. Then the therapist will say, right, well, if I did... I really owe you an apology and I owe you five minutes and I'll give it back to you at some point. But let's just start to think about this. Let's think about what was going on in the session at that stage and what you were saying or what I was saying. So this is thinking about thinking. And that's one of the jobs that uh, we as therapists um, uh, do. And it's one that's really come through the whole attachment, developmental and experimental world. My definition of mentalising is to see oneself from the outside and to see others from the inside. It's a kind of phenomenon of slow thinking. And mentalising is a hugely important um, phenomenon and it relates to secure attachment. So um, there's all kinds of experiments that have been done. One study that L Elizabeth Means did, she actually doesn't use the term mentalising, she calls it mind-mindedness, um, which is actually a rather a good phrase, I think. But she videotapes or audio tapes infants with their, or small children with their parents. Um, and she then um, shows these uh, videotapes or audio tapes uh, to the parents and asks the parents to comment on them. So they might, and the parent might say, oh dear, I was being a bit sort of uh, rough there and I told the kid to bloody well shut up or something. That's an example of mentalising. The mother is able to think about her self-thinking and those parents tend to have securely attached infants. Um, interesting recent research by Howard and Miriam Steele, so 30 years on, they're still using this concept. They've done a very good study in the Bronx with at-risk families. They're usually single parent mothers, um, often from ethnic minorities. And they did uh, an intervention study where they, mothers got either treatment as usual, which was actually quite good treatment. The treatment as usual was um, a health visitor coming once a week and helping the mum, versus a form of mentalising therapy where the mothers were videotaped with their infants and they were uh, in a group setting, look at themselves interacting with their infants and learn, as it were, to see what they do that's really good. So the therapists are very good at pointing out, oh, that was such a sensitive response that you uh, brought out there. So, and that fosters this kind of sensitivity and it fosters um, the capacity for mentalising and that in turn fosters the uh, capacity for secure attachment in the infants. And this concept of sensitivity is one that Mary Ainsworth developed right back in the 1960s and 70s. Um, the idea of what is the crucial feature of um, a secure uh, relationship, its sensitivity, what we call sensitivity, well sensitivity now, as it were, we see in terms of the capacity for mentalising. Yes, this is the study I was mentioning. Okay, let's have a bit of slightly light relief. Does anyone know what that is? It's a head louse. Good. Quite often it's interesting. Sometimes people have no idea what it is. Now, the re why am I showing you that? Well, um, the, the poet Robbie Burns wrote a famous poem, Ode to the Louse. Um, Robbie Burns was uh, a kind of a 
someone that the Me Too movement would not approve of, I suspect. He saw this beautiful girl um, with wonderful hair and was immediately attracted to her. And then he noticed that there was a head louse crawling unbeknownst to her on the top of her head. And so he wrote these wonderful lines. I'm not going to try and do it in Scottish. Oh, would some power the gift he give us to see ourselves as others see us. It would from many a blunder free us and foolish notion. Well, that to me summarises everything that psychotherapy is all about because it's about mentalising. Um, and another aspect of mentalising, yes, um, this, I mentioned listening right at the beginning of my talk. Um, a little anecdote here. I moved from UCH to uh, North Devon in the 1980s, it was, and um, worked in a district general hospital. There was a new psychiatric unit which uh, attracted me to it, and I had quite a nice office. Um, and I, uh, one of the surgeons who um, used to be, uh, who, like most surgeons, considered psychiatrists to be the lowest of the low, a kind of inferior form of medical life, uh, only for people who are completely dim or um, incompetent or very, very mad, um, would choose to be psychiatrists. He had to come to my office to discuss a patient, a mutual patient, and he was horrified. He said, but you've got a wonderful office here, or something like that. And all I've got is some little cubby hole where I've got to share with all the other surgeons and the secretary. So I said to him, John, he became a friend in the end, this is my operating theatre. <laughs> and uh, that has led me to think about what is the expertise, going back to um, the unmentionable MG, um, what is the expertise of the psychotherapist or the psychiatrist? Well, I think the expertise is what I call triple listening. Now, people tend to dismiss psychotherapy, psychiatry. They say, well, you know, what are you doing? You're just listening to people. Well, everybody listens to people. Well, my answer to that is, what is a surgeon doing? We can all sew on a shirt button, but there are probably very few of us that can report, repair a ruptured aorta. And it's a little bit the same with um, the work that psychotherapists do. And it's what I call triple listening, and it really flows from the idea of mentalising and attachment. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we do is we create a safe space. Now, that safe space, I would even say a sacred space, is a physical space, so it's got to be a space that feels warm, uninterruptible, I'm just repeating what I said earlier, um, a, safe where, uh, a space where that client can feel safe, to reveal themselves, to have a kind of conversation they would have with nobody else in their life, even their loved ones. But there's also a space inside the therapist. We have to create a space inside ourselves in which we are totally focused on the client and our own uh, preoccupations and worries and issues can be, um, as it were, kept outside for the 50-minute period. So, on the one hand, as it were, we empty ourselves of our narcissism, our preconceptions, our judgments. It's a quite an interesting issue. You know, do you have to be sort of psychologically incredibly healthy to be a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist? Well, obviously not, um, speaking from personal experience. <laughs> but you have to be able to put all that away so that you can focus on your client. So that's, as it were, the one component of the listening. We have to create a listening space. Secondly, we have to be able to listen to ourselves listening. That's what's known technically in psychoanalysis as the counter-transference. So while you're listening to the client, you will have all kinds of thoughts. Uh, actually, it's happening right now. During the course of this morning, you'll be thinking about things completely irrelevant. What am I going to do when I get home? I usually give the example. Um, I had a client who was nearing the end of therapy and he was the la my last patient of the day. And while I was listening to him, I suddenly thought, oh my God, I must remember to get that bottle of milk that my wife asked me to bring home. <laughs> that was me listening. And then I thought, why am I suddenly thinking about that? And then I thought, oh, well, of course, the milk of therapy is not going to be available for this client quite much longer because we've only got three more sessions to go. So that enabled me, as it were, to turn me listening to myself listening into an intervention and say, listen, I think we haven't really focused on what it's going to be like when this therapy comes to an end. And maybe it'd be great, you won't have to pay me anymore, you can get on with your life. But on the other hand, there may be some vital ingredient that's missing. So we create a listening space, we listen to ourselves listening, 
And then the third component is we have to be able to listen to ourselves being listened to. So when I say that to the client, I then have to watch and listen and observe how he or she is reacting to whatever it is that I've said. So um, that is all to do really with a kind of mentalising. So it's the capacity to put ourselves in our client's shoes, but also, as it were, uh, so that, uh, put, well, we have to be able to mentalise ourselves. What is it that I'm thinking about this client? What's come into my mind in relation to this client? And what is the relevance of it to, to this client? So that's kind of um, mentalising from the inside. And we then have to think, how is the client reacting to whatever it is that I'm saying? Another way of thinking about this mentalising from the attachment point of view um, is what I call playing the intimacy game hand up. Now, um, again, I'm sure there are people in this room who have tried to teach a card game to friends or children. Now, how do you teach someone to play a card game? Well, you don't just hand them the rules of the game and say, well, well, just read that and then we'll be able to play. What you do is you do a few rounds, as it were, with the hands face up. So they can see what's in your hand, you can see what's in their hand. Now, if we think about mentalising, we never, however, there are various moments in your life when perhaps another person is completely transparent. When you're madly in love with them, and this might be a, a newborn baby, or it might be a potential partner, but most of the time, we don't really know. We can never be absolutely certain what's going on in another person's mind. And a lot of our conversation is really about exploring that and trying, as it were, to um, say something which will then trigger something they will say, which will then enable us to know better what it, whatever it is that they're thinking. And we're doing this especially in the psychotherapy setting. But in the psychotherapy setting, in a way, we're saying our clients aren't very good at mentalising. We've got to teach them to play the mentalising game. And how are we going to do it? We're going to put our, our cards on the table. And we're going to ask them to put their cards on the table. Now, Freud said... The fundamental rule of psychoanalysis, which we have to explain to our clients, is to say anything or everything that comes into your mind, however irrele irrelevant, embarrassing it may seem, and however personal it may seem. So we really want to know if our clients think we're idiots or stupid or are madly in love with us or um, feel we should be sacked and referred to the General Medical Council, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and similarly, in a way, we put our own cards on the table, not explicitly. So I wouldn't have said to my client, oh, by the way, I've just remembered that I've got to get some milk on the way home. <laughs> but in a way, I was putting my cards on the table because I was using my countertransference. I was using my mentalising capacity to help that client. Um, the way I like to think about it now, because I've sort of gone in a neuroscience direction in the last few years, is to think that what we do when we mentalise, and what we do in therapy, and what babies do with their mothers, and how we think about the attachment, theory, uh, attachment relationship, is to think of it in terms of borrowed brains. And here's a lovely little study that was done, well, not so little, by Jim Cohen in Maryland a few years back. He put an advertisement in the local paper asking for happily married couples to come to his lab and um, to engage in a research project, and there will be a small fee. About 150 people applied. He then produced a questionnaire and he weeded out the really very happily married couples. I have to say, for a bit of fun, my wife and I did this and we would not have been included in the study. <laughs> and um, he then um, uh, created a paradigm in which, um, I don't know if it's the wife, but the poor old wife was put in the, uh, an fMRI scanner and she was told you will receive um, a very mild electric shock to your left leg at some point in the next 20 seconds. And he did it under three conditions, holding her husband's hand, holding a stranger's hand, and no hand holding at all. And then he looked in the fMRI scanner at the stress part of the brain, the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary um, adrenal axis, and saw to what extent that was lit up. In other words, there was uh, increased blood supply to it. And surprise, surprise, when you're holding your um, happily married partner's hand, then the stress level is far lower. So you are, in a sense, if you're on your own, you're having to do all the work for yourself and you've no idea how painful that shock is going to be or what the impact was, is uh, going to be. Whereas if you're holding the hand of somebody you trust, then you think, well, their prefrontal cortex, their thinking part of their brain, will be able to deal with 
and in our joint brain collaboratively um, cope with this stressful situation. Now, again, that's really a kind of neuroscience version of the affect regulation I was telling you about, about the borrowed brain. Um, Jim Cohn is actually a bit worried that the sort of outright um, uh, religious fundamentalists would cotton on to this and say, well, there you are, see, marriage is the answer to everything. So he did the same study with um, uh, uh, um, same-sex couples and found actually an even greater um, uh, uh, positive finding. This leads us on to this whole question of trust. And this is where there's a kind of evolution, and the, kind of, so the protagonist of this really is my friend and colleague Peter Fonagy, who started this study that I told you about in the 1990s um, with the uh, pregnant um, parents, moved on to mentalizing, and he's now moved on to this concept of epistemic trust. So if we say, well, attachment, the attachment relationship is um, going to protect you, it's going to help you to understand yourself, it's going to help you to be able to regulate your affect, um, it's going to be there for when you need it. That means that we, and you need a borrowed brain to do so. How do you trust the person who you are, as it were, investing all this in? And that um, is a crucial issue. Um, and we need to think about uh, how this happens. So in secure attachment, we have this concept, as it were, of ostensive communication. So the paradigm here is there's a frog in a bucket and there's a mum and a two, three-year-old and that frog is going barp, barp, barp and that child is simultaneously wants to explore that sound but doesn't know whether that barp, barp, barp comes from something that might harm them. Therefore, the child looks to the mother, non-verbally says, is it all right for me to explore that bucket? And the mother will as it were, verbally or non-verbally, say, it's okay, darling, just go and have a look. So we're all the time, as it were, using others to help us explore um, the universe which we find ourselves in. And our therapists will be doing that all the time, will be, as it were, subjected by our clients to this question, can, you, can we trust you? Are you somebody? I mean, okay, you've got all your qualifications, but what does that mean? Um, can we trust, I mean actually there's a really important point in psychotherapy in my opinion, that qualifications probably rule out, rules out that someone is actively dangerous, but it doesn't tell you whether that person is going to work for you. It's something that only you and maybe your friends um, and your partners can help you. I went to see this therapist, I, something about them just didn't make me, didn't feel quite right. Well, that's something you need to listen to. It's something you might bring to the next session with that therapist or it might make you go and find somebody else. So we've got this idea that epistemic trust. Is this somebody we can trust? Are you someone I can rely on me to make me feel safe? So where have we got to? We're talking about the diagnostic framework. Now one of the things about therapists is that on the one hand they, as it were, provide the safe space, they are attachment figures, but they also retain a degree of anonymity. They retain a degree, a degree I would say, of ambiguity. And I like to quote the art critic, um, uh, Gombrich, delight lies somewhere between boredom and confusion. So you want somebody who you know, makes you feel safe, but is also going to challenge you. There's something about ambiguity which grabs our attention. If you think about psychoanalysts and psychotherapists generally, Jean Laplanche, the French psychoanalyst, said a psychoanalyst is an enigmatic signifier. In other words, there's something inherently slightly enigmatic about the therapist. You don't lay all your cards on the table, to go back to that metaphor. And yet, at the same time, you have to be a reliable, secure kind of person. So it's an interesting role. And I think if we go right back to the beginning of my talk and saying, is the therapist an attachment figure? Well, in one sense they are, but in another sense they're not. Because if they're not, then that then creates opportunities for you to explore yourself and your feelings. And there's an interesting study, um, again, that's come out um, uh, in, from the Fonagy lab, where um, three or four-year-olds are shown pictures like this. And they're asked, well, is that a cat, or is it a squirrel, as it were? 
And the more securely attached you are, the more likely you are to be able to say, well, I don't really know, but I think it's a s most, I think it's mostly a cat. And um, the secure attached person, even if the, uh, there's a mother there, says, no, no, that's a squirrel, darling. The, the three or four year old will say, um, has been primed to say that. The three or four year old securely attached child, as it were, has got a mind of their own. They're able to evaluate the trustworthiness of the other. And that, after all, again, is the kind of thing that we're trying to do in therapy. So let's move on to our final section um, in the next last 10 minutes of my talk. You'll be delighted to hear. Uh, what about change promotion? So we've had the attachment relationship. We've had this kind of diagnostic framework and emphasized the importance of disorganized attachment and the kinds of conversations that we have with our clients. How do we um, promote change? from an attachment uh, um, point of view. I've mentioned the borrowed brain, so we're trying to help our patients move from self-sufficiency to the social brain, the borrowed brain. Um, and we're up against a difficulty, uh, which I illustrated with the kangaroo joey, because the more uh, sort of used to uh, fending for yourself and soothing yourself you are, the harder it is for you to trust your therapist. And this is hugely important from a therapist's point of view because they have to see that the way the client handles you is, as it were, a manifestation of their attachment history. The way I like to think about this is that we have to enter into the client's world. So we have to, as it were, communicate with the client in whatever way um, they do communicate. But then we've somehow got to pull them in a new direction. There have to be mutative moments. We have to have surprise. We have to think about, um, as I said, pressing the, uh, the uh, pause button and working out what is going on. Because without that, the psychic reorganization, which is the hallmark of successful psych psychotherapy, cannot occur. And here's a very interesting attachment study um, from Mary Dozier, which is, I think, uh, in need of replication, which illustrates this point to some extent. So what Mary Dozier did was she took therapists and clients, and um, they weren't actually psychotherapy therapists, but they were mental health professionals with their clients, and she uh, did the uh, adult attachment interview on both of them. So she classified both client and therapist um, in the secure, insecure spectrum. And she then looked at outcome. And what she found was that where the a pattern of insecure attachment corresponded between therapist and patient, the outcome was less good than when there was a contradiction or a discrepancy, if you like. So let's take the avoidant client. If you've got an avoidant client with an avoidant therapist, then the avoidant client may turn up late for therapy sessions, miss sessions, or even drop out. The avoidant therapist will then say, oh, well, my, my patient's sacked me. I'll move on to the next client. In other words, they reinforce their client's attachment pattern. Um, whereas the secure therapist or the therapist whose uh, attachment pattern is in the opposite direction, um, the more anxious direction, will follow up the client, ring them up, say, why did you, you know, you missed the session last week. Are you all right? Um, would you like to squeeze you in sometime later the week? Um, if they t consistently turn up five le minutes later for th sessions, we'll tackle that and say, I think we really need to know about what happens in that five, missing five minutes, and so on. So those contradictory or anomaly-related therapy patient matches lead to good outcomes. If we go in the opposite direction, if we have a very anxious client with a very anxious therapist, the client may sort of want to run over their session and the therapist say, well, they were just getting to something really interesting at the end of the session. I couldn't just stop it there. I had to go on for another 10 minutes. And then they rang me up in the middle of the week and said, can I have another session or I have to squeeze them in somewhere. Um, again, those kinds of client-therapist match produce less good outcomes. So we, as attachment-informed therapy, on the one hand, we're thinking about creating a secure attachment relationship but on the other hand, we're also thinking, as it were, of a more challenging, boundary-setting um, aspect. And it's that uh, discrepancy which is going to lead to change. 
So we need to just remind ourselves that attachment is not just about cuddling and holding. If we go back to our um, one-year-old or one-and-a-half-year-old and they're playing in a room and there's a, an electric plug in it and the child gravitates to the electric plug, the secure therapist, sorry, the secure caregiver, will be quite happy to say, no, you're not to go there. That is an aspect of uh, therapy, uh, of a, uh, fostering security, and that capacity in, among therapists, as it were, to look at boundaries, um, to challenge, is just as important as providing this secure um, environment. So good therapy accepts, but then gradually um, confounds defences. And we might say our job is to surprise our clients. I'll just give you one tiny little example. So this is from several years ago. It was a, my patient was a depressed man. He was about 56. He was rather uh, an articulate person. And he came in um, sort of in, and said in a very deadpan, rather affectless way, there's something about me, I, this is what I call Groucho Marxism, you know, I've never joined a club that would have me as its member. Um, he said, wherever I am, that's exactly where I don't want to be. And I, uh, intuitively, had a sort of wave of sadness come over me. This man, I mean, I knew his history, he'd had an appalling developmental history as a child. And I simply said, I find myself feeling really sad that you're so out of touch with your feelings. And he suddenly burst into tears. Um, and then when the tears subsided, he started laughing at himself. And then he said, I just want to be let be. Now, what was going on in that? Um, well, I think um, we have to think about his initial statement as a speech act. He was kind of saying, I don't want to be in this room. He was pushing me right away, and I was offering my brain. In this case, as it were, he was the one that was the thinking person, and I was using the affective part of my brain, my um, amygdala, if you like, as it were, to um, offer him a link between his pushing me away and this feeling of sadness. And so that was me listening to myself listening. That was the counter-transference. And then... I kind of reflected his sadness back, but I didn't just reflect it back in a straightforward way. I sort of owned my side, side to it. I held his hand, as it were, as in the Jim Cohen experiment, and he was able to release the negative affect, which I say is so important in terms of um, an, an attachment uh, informed approach to psychotherapy. So we're, in, we're more or less at the end of our talk. And I'm just going to end up with a couple of slides. So that's a disorganised child, I would say. That's someone who's had to cope with trauma on his or her own, um, who's got a kind of scream that has not been heard, who's got a scream that hasn't been um, uh, offered to a borrowed brain that would then help to uh, interpersonalise it and to regulate it and to turn it into feelings. And our job is to move our help try and help move our clients from that posture to that. That's the end of my talk. I just wonder, I don't know about anybody else, but that last example, I didn't quite get it all. And if you would go over it again. Um, okay, yeah. right. Um, I think what I was trying to illustrate here is this concept of the borrowed brain and the, the whole context of what I'm saying is in the context of attachment. So what is the role of the attachment relationship and what's the role of the attachment relationship in psychotherapy? And I think I've said, well, I feel that attachment has, as it were, moved, if we go back to Bowlby in the 1950s when he's devising it from this idea of attachment is a protection against threat. It's moved then on to the idea of attachment as affect regulation or co-regulation. And now we're in the world of neuroscience and we're in the world of a borrowed brain. And the brain, um, this is incredibly simplistic, but it's kind of got a kind of thinking part, um, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and it's got a feeling part which starts with the body but then um, transmits itself to the amygdala. And the amygdala is where... Uh, the uh, oxytocin operates, it's where the noradrenaline operates, where the dopamine operates. 
So the amygdala is rather like the Freudian id. And I'm saying that what we do in psychotherapy most of the time actually is our clients bring their affects to us, their feelings to us, but those affects haven't been regulated any more than that crying baby's affects haven't been regulated. And we, they borrow our prefrontal cortex to start to regulate and understand those feelings. In the example I gave, it was actually the other way around. So the client comes in with a affectless intellectual formulation. Where, wherever I am, that's exactly where I don't want to be. And rather than giving a complex interpretation of that and linking it up with childhood experience, I simply used my amygdala, my listening to myself listening response, which was I felt an overwhelming wave of sadness. So I lent him my sadness, which he could then link up with that feeling. And that then released the sadness in him, which enabled me to flip back into a more um, uh, uh, into, um, um, cognitive prefrontal cortex mode, and that was this little vignette that was trying, as it were, to show how we um, have moved along this spectrum in attachment from protection from uh, uh, predation through affect co-regulation to a neuroscience model. Now, does that answer, I hope that answers a little bit, and I'm sorry I didn't explain it properly in the talk. Hi. Thank you for the talk. So my question is about mentalizing. And you did mention that a mentalizing, uh, when parents mentalize, this affects how they relate to their children. <clears throat> so my question is how this, how this actually occurs and can you elaborate on that? Because it's not obvious to me how mentalizing can result in the secure attachment from the parent to the child in a in, in subsequent generation. And is there some, some, some sort of funny role of, of <clears throat> cognitive abilities when it comes to mentalizing, because mentalizing seems to me is not a very easy skill to, to master and, and to actually apply. So, so can you please okay. elaborate on that? Very good, very good question, um, and thank you for it. Well, I think the first thing we need to uh, differentiate is explicit and implicit mentalizing. And implicit mentalizing we do all the time, and the example I like to give, maybe it's not a good one, but if you live in a town, as probably most people here do, um, you're walking down the street, it's a busy, crowded street, it's very unusual that people bump into each other. And when they very occasionally do, you get this funny thing where someone goes right and they, the other person goes right and then someone goes left and the other one goes left, rather than the usual thing of that. I think implicitly we are reading the other people's brains and working out what their trajectory is. Uh, or tra trajectory of uh, walking is and adjusting ours so that we don't bump into each other. That's implicit mentalizing. It's only when things go wrong, as in that bumping, bumping example, that we have to move to explicit mentalizing because although we may just laugh at each other, you know, and then move on, but you might even say, oh, I'm really sorry, or something of that sort. So you're moving in the direction of more explicitly saying, I thought you were going to go left, you thought I was going to go right, and that's why this little impasse has happened. So we've got implicit mentalizing, explicit mentalizing. Now, I would say um, there's no correlation whatsoever between verbal ability and implicit mentalizing. Um, there may be correlation, um, although I, I, the research actually is not particularly uh, convincing here. There may be some, uh, and I think in Mary Main's original studies, there was no correlation whatsoever between reflexes, uh, between the capacity to mentalize um, and, uh, or the reflexes, or in the, sorry, in the Fonagy um, Steele study between the capacity to mentalize and IQ. Um, so it's just seen as a protective factor. Um, so when, we're, uh, when, May, when Elizabeth uh, Means is studying the mind mindedness of mothers, she's just sort of asking them ordinary questions, you know, what do you think um, little Johnny uh, was uh, doing when he um, was pushing that little train along and then he threw it across the room? Um, and then she might say, oh, well, I think he was a bit hungry, really. You know, he, um, he usually has his uh, lunch about 12 o'clock and I had to delay it this, this, this day and maybe he was a bit upset about that or he just felt hungry. That's that mother reading the child's mind um, in a very intuitive, um, non 
uh, intellectual way. Um, but, uh, I mean, in a way it's not answering your question. Um, so the is, or what means found, was that the caregivers who were good at doing that tended to have children who were securely attached. Whereas the caregivers who said, oh, I don't know, he's just a little bugger, he's always throwing his toys around. <laughs> that would be a non-mentalizing response and would tend to be associated with... Um, uh, tend to be associated with insecure attachment. I mean, th there are all sorts of issues that I haven't raised. I mean, there may be, there are certain circumstances in which, as it were, it might be a jolly good idea not to mentalise. I mean, I usually give the example, you know, if um, a lion suddenly walked into this room um, and was about to sort of eat me, I'm not going to say, well, I wonder what's going on in the lion's, the lion's mind. <laughs> so if you use the Kahneman slow and fast thinking paradigm, Mentalizing is slow thinking, but we need fast thinking in certain situations, and the last thing we need to do is to mentalize. Well, if you are a highly stressed individual li living, living in very difficult socioeconomic circumstances or with a husband who's beating you or something of that sort, then actually your sort of mentalizing time will be reduced to a minimum. So we have to think of it in a way, uh, in a contextual fashion. And again, I think that's something that's hugely important about Bowlby, was that he was always looking at the social context. I mean, I haven't said very much about that, but he was always looking at the um, social context of difficulties. His original um, sort of most famous paper was called 44, 44 Juvenile Thieves, and he was uh, forever known after that as Ali, Bal Ali Bowlby and the 44 Thieves. Um, but the study that he did there was essentially to show that these delinquent boys who were caught for thieving, came up before the courts, had, um, the vast majority of them, um, had had um, traumatic events in childhood, death of parent, divorce, separation, that sort of thing. So he was saying, the environment determines our psychological states and our behaviours. And that was quite heretical in the world of psychoanalysis at the time, because that was seen, um, uh, the, you know, the thieves' psychopathology would have been seen in terms of internal hatred and envy or something of that sort. So, uh, or the reason I brought that in, other than just going back to Bowlby, was um, to say that um, we need to think about these things in a kind of contextual way, and that so-called insecure attachment may be highly appropriate in certain environmental circumstances. In fact, I don't really like the term insecure attachment because it has a negative connotation, whereas it is purely descriptive, in fact. Um, I, th I think I heard you say, but I'm not positive, that securely attached people would, would find psychotherapy easier, at least in the beginning. Um, in which case, is that what, well, kind of I'll what you said? Make your point. <laughs> in which case, how does one deal with people who find it very difficult the first mm. session and maybe go through five or six mm. therapists and then give up, okay. um, despite the fact that they're probably needy and, and would benefit hugely from it? Well, again, a lovely question. Um, I think three points I'll make, not an answer to it. Um, one is, I think I had a slide which I call the inverse care law. Um, this was actually based on um, a GP, uh, Julian Tudor Hart, who in, uh, wrote a sort of very seminal paper um, called the inverse care law about general practice. And what he essentially said, uh, and what he was observing, and this was a way back, um, was that if you want uh, the people who have access to really good medical care are those who need it the least. Um, so the standard of general practice in sort of leafy suburbs is pretty high. The standard of, uh, of general practice in inner city uh, environments where there's far more illness, mental and physical, um, tends to be very low. And he, it's a kind of joke because it's the, in, of course, it's the inverse square law which Newton devised um, to explain gravity but he calls it the inverse care law. And in a way, it applies to the world of psychotherapy because there's a kind of paradox, which is that the more um, psychologically unwell you are, the more you need therapy, the less um, easy it is to uh, benefit from therapy. And conversely, you know, if you're reasonably psychologically healthy, you're going to do pretty well. And I do think we have to have a bit of a sort of triage approach. In other words, we need to think, well, there are some people who are kind of going to be okay or anyway, and they can probably... Um, benefit from IAPT or benefit from relatively short-term therapy. There are others who probably, however hard we try um, with standard psycho 
therapy are not going to do that well. And then certainly when I was working as a psychiatrist, I had a whole group of patients who I uh, offered what I call supportive psychotherapy, which is completely unending, uh, uh, open-ended rather, something like half an hour session once a fortnight for the next, I think my record was 23 years. Um, so, um, and then in the middle was a group of people who are going to find therapy difficult, but who can really benefit from it and who are insecurely attached, and that's going to manifest itself in all kinds of difficult ways in the therapy, particularly in the early stages. And our job as therapists is to move in what is termed in the attachment literature earned security. I consider myself to be earned secure, thanks to my analyst and my wife. Um, but um, earned security is, as it were, moving from a rather insecure pattern towards more security, and it can happen in the context of therapy. But um, you need to be able to, uh, as it were, anticipate all the difficulties that will occur. And that's one of the great things, for instance, about mentalization-based therapy, which is designed particularly for people with borderline personality disorder, many of whom would have been, di uh, would have been classified as disorganized as infants. And built into MBT is the idea that the early stages of therapy are going to be really difficult and things are going to go wrong and the clients are going to drop out and not turn up and come late and um, suddenly start throwing things around in the consulting room and that kind of thing, which enables me to tell a tiny little anecdote about a colleague of mine who had had a previous life as a head teacher and she had one of these very difficult clients in, her, um, uh, in the early set s stages and she had, as many therapists do, lots of a bookshelf in her room. And the client got up and said something like, you're completely useless, I'm going to pull those stupid books out of your bookshelf and throw them all over the floor. And she suddenly found herself in head teacher mode saying, you most certainly will not. <laughs> and that was a little bit like the mum saying to the two-year-old when approaching the light socket, no, have I answered your point? I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was looking back to when you were saying that uh, under threat we turn to our, uh, the person or thing we feel attached to. I got the impression through the conversation and the discussion you were having uh, that depending on the kind of threat it might change uh, what we're attached to because our attachment will depend on the particular threat that we have. Do you have any comment around that? Uh, so if something that I'm threatened that would, I would then turn to my mother for, another kind of threat, I might turn to something else. Well, that's a really interesting point, and I think uh, I'm not going to exactly answer it, but it sort of came up in the discussion in the break. It's a funny noise going. Um, which is um, one of the early findings from Mary Ainsworth was that if you do the strange situation with infants, um, and measure their attachment pattern with their dad and with their mum, they don't necessarily correlate. So you can be as securely attached to mum and insecurely attached to dad, or vice versa. And this was used as a very strong argument against um, those who claimed that the whole attachment classification had nothing to do with uh, the environment, and nothing to do with the context, and was a purely uh, genetic, temperamental factor. Um, because clearly, if it's a matter of temperament, in the infant, then you're going to have the same attachment pattern with your both parents. Whereas if it's contextual, then you're going to have a different attachment pattern. So I think your question um, is a very interesting one. I mean, I, my sort of experience, whether it's my life experience or my clinical experience, would be slightly against that. Um, and it's an interesting issue because to me, the attachment figure is the person whom you trust most of all, let's put it that way. And whatever the threat is, you know, whether it's... Um, but I suppose you might, um, I don't know, say you're threatened with bankruptcy, or you're threatened with your wife walking out on you, or your child having a life-threatening illness. I suppose one could imagine there would be different people you would turn to in those circumstances. So I think you're raising a very interesting issue, and one that I'm not aware has been particularly explored in the, in the attachment literature. So, but I, I, I can't sort of answer your point, but it's a very interesting one. Thank you. <clears throat> very nice to hear from your voice what I've been studying. <clears throat> I learned my Bowlby ABC through your books. And <clears throat> I realized that uh, attachment theory has moved 
with the times and embraced uh, neuroscience, regulation, etc. Has it done a similar thing in relation to feminist critique and queer theory, according to which a, a bold being attachment theory has reinforced the patriarchal family and has pushed back mother into the kitchen because so we can have, you know, very uh, regulated babies and so forth? Great question. I make two responses to it. One, just to reinforce what you said, there was a huge feminist uh, reaction or backlash against Bowlby's ideas in the 1960s. Uh, the leader of this really was Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, who said more or less exactly what you've just said, which is that oh, you know, you're just trying to confine mothers into the kitchen um, and um, it just reinforces a kind of patriarchal picture of things. Um, I think the answer to that, um, I think, comes from uh, Sarah Hurdy's work, if you're familiar with this, um, but it's, uh, I don't hope you don't mind me quoting Hillary Clinton, the title of her book, It Takes a Village, but It Takes a Village um, is uh, the African saying, it takes a village to raise a child. And I think what Mar Margaret Mead said was actually, and not in anthropologically, and if you look across the, the globe, then children are actually brought up by a collective. And that collective is predominantly, but not exclusively, female, but it's mum, grandparents, older siblings, cousins. Um, and Michael Tomasello ha makes a big emphasis on this, that one of the extraordinary and uh, unique features of our species, of the human primates, is this collaborative ch child care. So actually children are brought up collectively. And that, um, of course, in the sort of contemporary world, would include, um, I mean, we do know that I think 50% of grandmothers um, are involved in their ch children's uh, care you know, in the UK. Um, but it's not grandfathers much. Um, but we have to include childminders and um, uh, ch nurseries and so on. In this, it takes a village. So, um, but that's still on the feminine, female side. So we, we moved away from this exclusive preoccupation with mother and child and show that mother is, as it were, the apex of a hierarchy of attachment figures which may be relevant to our friend's point here. If we look at more very recent research um, that my friend and colleague Ruth um, Feldman has done um, in Israel, she now is looking at uh, single parent dads, she's looking at uh, single sex male uh, child rearing couples. Um, so she's looking in a way at the modern family. And what's completely fascinating, because she's essentially a uh, neuroscientist, is that the endocrinology is the same in dads. So when you have a dad as the primary caregiver, his oxytocin levels go up just like with mums. And the biobehavioral synchrony in which the baby's oxytocin levels mirror those of the caregiver and the caregiver's mirrors those of the baby is also found in these primary caregiving dads. So I think there's still, as it were, a gender deficit in the research. And I still think that attachment theory does, and you may have noticed it in the way I was talking even, does tend to think of attachment in terms of uh, mothers and babies. But there is the beginnings of a movement in the opposite direction. And it's a very interesting issue in the world of psychoanalysis as well, because of course, Freud really was primarily interested in fathers and sons. And the whole Oedipus complex is really all about fathers and sons. And then the second half of the 20th century, when Melanie Klein and Anna Freud were the sort of dominant figures, we moved and dads kind of disappeared in a way from the psychoanalytic model. So I think there's a constant sort of dialectic and debate to be had in this area. And I can't say more than that, especially as it's 12 o'clock. <laughs> we can have a round of applause.